Hello everyone, uh, before we get into the exciting episode today, I just want to let you all know that uh, if you head on over to the World War II podcast uh, with Angus Wallace, there is an interview with me where we talk about the Spanish Civil War and its place in the kind of history of 20th century conflict. It was a real pleasure to record. Angus is a, a great presenter and a really lovely guy. So if you head on over to the, the World War II podcast, you can listen to me and him talking. Now on with the episode. I want you to imagine yourself as a soldier in a battle that lasts for four years. Not a war, a battle. The same valley, the same mountains, the same ground. Fought over for four years, with both sides making little or more often no gains at all. Your army is under-equipped and undermanned, but that doesn't stop your general from planning yet another offensive. You've lost count of how many that is now. Is it the seventh or maybe the eighth? All in all, it doesn't matter. To you, it's all the same. One endless battle. This is the story of the Isonzo Front. The story of history's worst stalemate. Hello, and welcome back to another very special episode of History's Most, History's Worst Stalemate. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and uh, today we are joined by um, Freddie Clifford, who is my brother. Um, Hello. Yeah, um, Freddie is uh, particularly interested in, well, among other things in history, the First World War and the Italian front in the First World War, which is probably a front that... I would say gets a far less coverage, certainly in um, the English-speaking world, than, say, the Western Front. And he knows an awful lot more about it than me. So when we thought about doing history's worst stalemate, it made sense to uh, invite him on the show. Uh, so what is history's worst stalemate? Uh, history's worst stalemate. Um <laughs> is in my opinion uh the italian front of world war one it's the 12 no less than 12 battles of the isonzo river okay 12 battles of one river interesting i mean and, and we're talking about 12 battles uh over the course of what just over two years as well so it's not exactly... uh, yeah from a about mid 1915 to the end of 1917 so two and a half years i mean it's it's in a way an impressive achievement to have got in that many battles well there's time. there's a uh, method to the madness the <laughs> uh the reason they managed to achieve this is because it's probably the two single most incompetent armies of the war squaring off against each other <laughs> Um, in an endless competition of mediocrity. <laughs> I mean, um, th that sounds incredibly history's most. Um, and I'm not just talking about the mediocrity. Um, so let's uh, dive into this stalemate. This indecisive deadlocked front is, as you've kind of teased there, between two incompetent, mediocre armies or powers and it's obviously the Italians, the Kingdom of Italy, facing off against the Austro-Hungarian army. Um, yep. So, I mean, to understand why they're so uh, mediocre, I suppose we should talk a little bit about um, you know, the characteristics of uh, the Italian and Austro-Hungarian armies prior to the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess... Um, th th there, there are reasons as to why they underperformed. Um, Italians, for example, uh, were very young comparatively to uh, 
the other armies. I mean, you think about, you know, the armies of France and Britain uh, were, you know, long established. Uh, and the German army was, um, you know, relatively young as well, but they had a lot of experience. Um, the Italian army, uh, I mean, Italy was only unified in 1861. And uh, they hadn't fought many wars um since that time they they'd uh i mean prior to world war one the two sort of major wars they've been involved in uh were uh an attempted uh invasion of ethiopia which ended disastrously from 1894 to 1896 uh which you know i mean you think about a, a european colonial power being defeated by an African country, that's a big it, deal. It rings a bell for our when we talked about Spain yeah. in the early twentieth yeah. century, and it's certainly the sign of a backward power, isn't it? When they're trying to have a, get involved in European colonialism, and if they're yeah. struggling against, you know, as we say, African nations, at that time it really shows how backwards their military mm. is, and especially since you know uh, the Ethiopian Empire at that time, you know, we're still relying on antiquated uh, tactics and equipment, you know, a lot of them still armed with swords and spears and the Italians still managed to lose to them. Um, and they fought a brief war, the Italians fought a brief war against the Ottoman Empire in 1911 to 1912 in the Balkans and um, the Libyan desert and uh, they won that one. Um, but it's not a huge achievement uh, because the Ottoman Empire obviously was you know, crumbling already by that time. Uh-huh. Um, so perhaps the Ottomans are more incompetent than the Italians. I don't know. Are they more but, incompetent uh, than the Austro-Hungarians? <laughs> well, by extension, they'd have to be. But... Um, because uh, I'd, I'd argue that the Italians, um, though technically they did win World War I, uh, they're on the winning side, um, in a lot of aspects... They Very were, much they, technically <laughs> with that one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. In a lot of aspects, as we'll see, they, they were inferior to the Austro-Hungarians. Um, the Italian officer corps, this is really where the, the root of the issue lies. Um is the officer corps and Italy's officer corps was just dominated by sort of old style nepotism. It was just, you know, uh, people of nobility were, you know, granted um, officers, commissions, uh, high ranking, you know, the general staff were all, you know, basically, uh, basically bought their ranks. I mean, it, basically, the, the situation was um, that you had a lot of extremely privileged and uh, incompetent uh, officers dominating the high ranks of the Italian army who didn't have much actual experience. They're very theoretical. Mm. Um, they, 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 you know, uh, never really, uh, many of their tactics prior to the war the test um and just assumed that they would work they're, they're yeah very sort of you know pencil pushes and um didn't really uh involve themselves very heavily with uh you know actual um exercises or uh, they, they weren't really up to date with modern military tactics uh, they were very sort of disconnected from um, the reality of uh, sort of 20th century um, military advances. Uh, Austro-Hungarians were slightly more sort of, you know, up to date. But I think their main weakness um, was really how they were structured. Because obviously Austria-Hungary is dual monarchy. It was, you know, it was many different sort of countries. Um, it was it was an empire. You know, it was many different 
uh, European countries in war. And that means, you know, massive amounts of different ethnic groups. Uh, they reach their own languages and cultures. And it's very hard to structure an army when you're drawing such a diverse, you know, group of uh, citizens. Um, so they were structured into three main components. They were structured into the Austrian Landwehr, which was just, you know, the uh, successor of the, you know, Austrian army, which never really disbanded after Austria-Hungary was formed. Um, and the Hungarian army, which was, again, Hung um, Hungary retained its military rather than merging into the Austrian. Um, but there was a separate organ, which was a merged army. So you had the Royal Army, which was uh, you know, drawing from Austria and Hungary and, you know, many of the other different states like Czechoslovakia, well, I mean, uh, Croatia, Is Poland. Worth for a second delving into the weird ethnic and political mix that you had in Austria-Hungary, because it was a Habsburg ember, it was the Habsburg monarchy that um, you know had 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 lands in this region for centuries. They were the emperors of Austria, and they had in the nineteenth century merged with Hungary. Hmm. And the lands that the, these two, this dual monarchy, as you say, controlled um, in modern. Uh, um, European borders we're looking at um, obviously Austria and Hungary but also Slovenia Croatia, yeah. Bosnia uh, you know, I say, Czech Republic Slovakia, I mean parts of Romania, parts of Ukraine yeah. parts of Poland I mean I say like, you know, I say Poland, Czechoslovakia, I, I mean really it was, you know uh, different parts of these countries <laughs> they they weren't independent at this time obviously um, they were all kind of absorbed under Austria-Hungary. So you had, you know, a, a massive ethnic mix of like Austrians, Hungarians, Czechs, Croats, Poles, Slovakians, Slovenians, even you know some Italians in, yes. uh, you know, sort of southern. There were, I believe, there areas. were seven hundred thousand Italian speakers in the empire. Yeah. Hmm. Um. So. And that, of course, is uh, one of the reasons that, or well, the main driving force between why you know. Italy involves itself in the war, as you know, got on to. Um, but basically, yeah, that this is the the real problem of the Austro-Hungarian army is it's too kind of ethnically diverse, and uh, as a result, you know, structuring this thing is a complete nightmare. Um, so they have you know three main components of the army, and on top of that, they have uh, sort of bunch of additional reserves that you know aren't formed under one umbrella organization but they have you know a separate austrian and separate hungarian reserves um and you know it's really just a uh, sort of logistical nightmare i mean dividing um equipment up between these i mean presumably all three of these uh, armies would have had separate, you know, purchasing commissions for buying equipment. They wouldn't have standardized, uh, you know, weapons but, uh, across all of the empire. Um, it, it just, it's not a very good way to structure a military. And you know, on top of that, um, maybe could have worked if there was some sense of sort of uh, national unity in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, if all these different ethnic sort of groups felt any kind of loyalty towards preserving the empire, but it really just wasn't the case. Um, there was, you know, independence movements that were kind of forming even before the war. Um, and they only kind of grew in size, you know, as the war went on. I know one so... of the reasons that um, uh, the Austrian military felt it necessary to go to war in 1914, because after all, the war was triggered by the assassination of yeah. the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. But yeah. he was assassinated by a group of 
Austro-Hungarian uh, citizens. Hmm. They were um, Serbs, but they were citizens of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, so it's an internal problem within the empire that is the trigger event for the war. And, and the army basically said that if we don't go to war with Serbia over this assassination, even though it wasn't actually Serbian citizens who did it, we will just provoke more nationalist movements within other yeah. you know, nationalities who are going to think we're a soft touch. So really, there was there was a real danger of the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, declining and collapsing. That was really kind of the impetus of going to war in the first place. Uh, the commander-in-chief is uh, Count Konrad von Hartzendorf, who is appointed uh, for that role in 1906, and he's basically kind of um, yeah he has an immense amount of power politically in Austria-Hungary prior to World War One, and he is the main sort of uh, force pushing for war against Serbia. Uh, he is sort of drastically underestimates um, how successful that war will be. Um, and he predicts that, you know, I think he predicts that Serbia will fold in something like 30 days. And, you know, it'll be a great victory for Austro-Hungary and they'll, they'll, you know, reunite the crumbling empire. Uh, and of course, as we know, it doesn't go that way at all. Right? Right. From the outset, from yeah. even I mean, right from the outset, the Austro-Hungarians are, you know, sort of facing real yeah. difficulty militarily. Yeah. I think Austria and Hungary both wanted, although they were, you know, merging under a dual monarchy, they both wanted to retain some kind of autonomy. Yeah. Um, and that and doesn't Hungarians... really work had their own parliament and they had really in the 10 years leading up to the war restricted the military budget which obviously in the end wasn't very helpful mm. um, so that the, the Austro-Hungarian army was very outdated really um, in terms of its equipment particularly it was lacking in artillery which of course would be one yeah. of the most important weapon well probably the most important weapon of the first mm. world war I mean, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even the Italians going into the war are uh, much better equipped in terms of artillery pieces than the Austrians. I mean, I was uh, apparently the average um, common army division in the Austro-Hungarian Empire had forty-two artillery pieces, and that compared to sixty in the Russian army, where you know the Russian army yeah. is often held up, particularly in the First World War, as being outdated and backwards and mm. crumbling. But not only that, but only two thirds of those were modern artillery pieces, um, and all Austro-Hungarian artillery pieces. I couldn't believe this were um, had their barrels cast in bronze, not steel, which meant that they were heavier than other nations, and they had a shorter range. So when they went to war with Serbia in 1914, they found out that the Serbian heavy artillery had a range three kilometers longer. Um, than their own and they didn't have, I mean a lot of nations struggled with shells sh uh, shortage of shells but they were also really poorly served as far as that that was concerned without us even going into um, you know these structural problems around eth different ethnicities or nationalities and I mean just languages seems like it would be such yeah, a problem it was as well because um and although i mean even within uh you know these armies there was divide uh like further divides between you know companies and um so you know you would have uh it, it's so inconsistent you'd occasionally you you'd have things you know you'd have like czech companies made up entirely of um you know ethnic czechs uh, but then sometimes you'd have mixed ethnicity companies where, you know, the soldiers will all be speaking different languages. And there's these, you know, horror stories where, you know, uh, an Austrian officer will give an order in German. And, um, you know, th they'll have to interpret to, you know, 
<laughs> to Croat troops or, you know, uh, Czech troops or something like that. And I, I, I imagine for some of them that was probably quite a bit of guesswork going on as to what the hell they were supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's, you know, you can maybe work under those conditions uh, in peacetime, but certainly not in the heat of battle. And, that and is also, not ideal. Think, yeah, war puts a strain on the army because pre-war, you know, to be an officer in the army, you had to learn at least two languages. Um, Hotzendorf knew, knew seven, actually. Um, but, yeah. Um, they had this idea of the language of service, which in the common army and in the Austrian army was German, but in the Hungarian army was Hungarian, um, where that would be the language of command. And all soldiers had to learn 80 words in that language. But, you know, it would be like attention. Yeah. And, and basically, um, despite the that, sort of um, multi-ethnic nature of the army, Austrian and Hungarian uh, officers were definitely favoured. Um, having said that, on the Italian front, um, Hartzendorf did appoint a uh, Croat as um, the sort of uh, uh, commander of the Italian front um it was general borovich um basically yeah it was mostly the officer corps was mostly made up of austrians and hungarians and they were giving the orders um so um the there was an additional concession that if 20 percent of soldiers in a regiment spoke a different language spoke a language that was designated as a regimental language so you were supposed to, everyone was supposed to, you know, be able to communicate in that language. Um, so you had, um, but but less than half of the army's regiments in 1914 had only one official language because they mm. were less, but even then you'd have a minority probably of less than 20% might speak a different language. But you had 162 regiments that had two languages of being 20% or more. You had 24 regiments that had three languages of 20% of the men in it or more could speak three, you know, those three different languages or, or sorry, spoke those three different languages. And then you had a handful that even, you know, had four and that's those that meet that 20% threshold. So I think often you would have minorities making up a smaller number than 20% and they wouldn't even be recognized as having a, a regimental language, so to speak. So, Amongst all the problems um, that we've kind of listed there, um, for the Italians being just quite a inexperienced and um, maybe even slightly corrupt military, and the Austro-Hungarians being a you know such a diverse to the point of in all <laughs> disorganized military. Yeah, but then at least surely they would have had competent commanders in chief right no <laughs> um so as we mentioned uh we should probably cover the two commanders in chief of the uh the italian and austro-hungarian armies respectively the chiefs of staff and the chief of staff of the uh austro-hungarian forces covering you know all three of the armies is uh Conrad von Hartzendorf. He's an old, very old uh sort of officer, nineteenth century pretty much. Um and but he uh, had a reputation from the eighteen nineties of being a real innovator, being a kind of trailblazer, a, a bit of a dare I even say kind of military genius. Well, yes, but he didn't really have much experience. Um and Although I think, yeah, he did modernize the uh, Austro-Hungarian army quite a lot. Um, there is that thing of what was modern in, you know, the 1880s or 1890s isn't necessarily modern anymore by World War One, mm -hmm. um, because the technology changed so quickly. So, and and infantry tactics, of course, you know, changed so rapidly as well. And Hartzendorf's main sin is that he fails to adapt to, you know, the ever-changing pace of warfare. Mm -hmm. And he is hopelessly self-confident. 
and massively <laughs> overestimated and even from the outset as we mentioned you know he thought that serbia and russia could be defeated in 30 days <laughs> so yeah he basically uh i think believed too much in his own hype and <laughs> the you know he knew best and uh the his strategies would, you know, again, like um, I was saying about the Italian office, it was very theoretical. He had these, mm-hmm. you know, great plans on paper, which would never really materialize uh, in practice. And... Yeah, I mean, he he was a real um, adherent to, to be fair, a lot of commanders of his generation that found themselves in command in World War One of the, the kind of cult of the offensive, the mm. idea that, um, you know, being aggressive, being decisive, um, the troops being um, kind of energetic and in high spirits could overcome any kind of issues of firepower. Um, yeah. So he really neglected the importance of artillery and machine guns in favor of the bayonet charge and the kind of morale of the army being far more important to the idea that, and you know, plenty of people did sign up to this as well. Joffre, the French commander at the start of the war, definitely was an adherent to this. Um, that it's all about the kind of elan. It's all about the kind of fighting spirit of your army. And that yeah. you know, enough men, enough brave men will be able to overcome any kind of obstacle, no matter how many guns are defending it. Um hmm. he he his final manual before the war started was written in nineteen eleven, um, infantry manual, and it said that um well I I I'll I'll read you a little bit. Um that foot soldiers could win the victor's laurels even without support from other weapons and against enemy uh, numerical superiority if imbued with confidence and aggression, if equipped with unbendable steadfastness of will and the greatest physical toughness. So a lot of um, pre-war drilling of the Austro-Hungarian army had been focused on um, forced marches the idea yeah. that the next war would be a war of manoeuvre, that they would be really physically fit and able to move swiftly. Um, and I think a lot of the criticism comes from the fact that that obviously doesn't play out. I mean, still sort of stuck in a 19th century mindset, really. Um, Luigi Cadorna, the chief of staff of the Italian army, um, is very much the same, but almost amplified. <laughs> in his uh negative qualities um he is you know rose through the ranks you know pretty much completely through as i was saying like nepotism and um well, i was interested you mentioned nepotism because I, I i i had had read that his father was a general in the Italian yeah, army yeah. Who'd fought in the reunification yeah. wars um but then when he mentioned nepotism i was like oh okay <laughs> I can see how that plays out. <laughs> yeah, uh, his family, he came from a very well-respected uh, family of nobility, uh, which helped a lot in the Italian army, uh, right up until really World War II. I mean, it never really went away, even after uh, the First World War. Um, and uh, he was actually, uh, to his credit, um, he was you know, a very long-serving Officer, he, he you know even before World War One, he had forty six years under his belt. Wow. So you know, I suppose from his point of view, you know, becoming chief of staff had been a long time coming. Um, and uh, like Hartzendorf, he was uh, sort of aggressively uh, modernized the Italian army. Um, he was you know a, a real militarist. Um, he did you know spending. Uh, increased under his tenure, uh, manpower increased dramatically, uh, the artillery pieces. Um, so he really, you know, brought the Italian army into the uh, 20th century. Um, and saying about being sort of uh, 
theoretical. Uh, Cadorn was incredibly theoretical. Uh, he was a, I suppose, a redeeming attribute of him was he was extremely organized and sort of logistical. Um, and, you know, very uh, concerned with, you know, numbers and statistics. And, um, but he was incredibly thin skinned. Um, so, right from the outset, and he's only appointed in 1914, so he only had a you know, year of experience before, as chief of staff before uh, mm -hmm. World War One. Um, well, before the Italians entered World War One, I, I should say. Um, he is uh, completely intolerant to any opposing opinions. Any criticism of him is just uh, punished. Um, he fires more of his officers than any other chief of staff in World War One. I've got um, 217 generals, apparently, alone. <laughs> and that's oh, just God. generals. Um, 255 colonels, 337 lieutenant colonels. So that's that's well over 700 senior officers sacked. In yeah. So just to give you an idea of, um, and yeah, and like Hartzendorf, he believes in sort of the unbreakable spirit of the infantry being able to overcome any obstacle. And he'll go a step further than Hartzendorf by saying that, uh, or by, you know, asserting that infantry that underperforms, um, is in need of severe punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, he executes um, I think, you know, something like 4,000 uh, Italian troops are executed uh, by firing squads for cowardice during World War One. He's kind of a disciplinarian to the point of um, well, <laughs> far beyond excess. And like you say, his, 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 his version of warfare is all about morale. The idea that the army with the superior morale will always win, but his concept of how to maintain that morale is just you know, yeah. authoritarian. Yeah, mm. terror really, isn't it? It's, we, the only kind of things you can really say it, mitigating factors to Cadorna is he's only appointed in 1914, and Italy joins the war in 1915, and reportedly. Um, he was completely in the dark about Italian foreign policy, so he didn't know that they were going to, um, unlike Konrad von Hotzendorf, who had a huge influence on, you know, hmm. Austro-Hungarian foreign policy, been pushing for war against Serbia, war against Italy, war against Romania, you know, for de for you know, for many years he'd been pushing for war. Um, on the other hand, Cadorna didn't have much time in the job and didn't know that yeah. the Italians intended to go to war with the Austrians. Um, in fact, he was, believe, he was drawing up plans to invade France because Italy was formerly in an alliance yeah. with Austria and Germany. Yeah, so in 1882, uh, Italy signs the Triple Alliance with um, Austria-Hungary and Germany, which they you know, break in May 1915 when they decide to enter the war on the side of the... Uh, Western Allies. Um, what they didn't know about it is that they'd actually renewed it in 1912. <laughs> yeah, which is why the uh, Austrians and the Germans were so shocked when Italy decided to enter the war against them. They thought that they'd be able to rely on Italy's support, and when Italy didn't come through for them in 1914, you know, they, there was very much this sort of... Uh, um, the Italians were basically viewed by uh, the Austro-Hungarians as traitors. So um, let's very briefly um, lay out kind of how we get to the situation in mid-1915 where we've got this war breaking out on the Italian-Austrian frontier that is going to be history's greatest stalemate. We've seen that the two sides are two armies which are not really you know, up to scratch by modern yeah. standards in 1914. We've got two commanders whose philosophies, if you like, are bound to lead to um, failure and stalemate. 
Um, so obviously war breaks out in 1914, in the end of July 1914, with the Austrian ultimatum to the Serbs, um, which the Austrians deliberately designed so that Serbia cannot accept it and it will lead to war. Um, ironically, uh, when it came to the declaration of war, Conrad von Hotzendorf asked for it to be delayed till August because he wasn't ready, despite planning for war for years. Um but it was declared on the 28th of July. You then had the kind of domino effect of the Germans who'd given the Austrians assurance that they would support them no matter what they did um, come into the war. The Russians come to the support of the Serbs, etc., etc. Now, von Hotzendorf was well aware of the fact of the Schlieffen plan that the Germans would focus on the French first and that it would be the Austrian-Hungarians' job to deal with the Russians. The complete um, mystery of the situation is the fact that Hotzendorf seems to have hoped that he could defeat Serbia quickly, then focus on the Russians. Because of the plans in place, the mobilization plans, he had activated the Balkan War plan instead of the War Against Russia plan. So he had started to move um, the Austro-Hungarian army to face Serbia. And on the 31st of July, government basically says to him, We've, we're more worried about the Russians than we are the Serbs. And criminally, um, on the evening of 31st of July, Conrad asks the war ministry, well, let's switch plans, let's switch kind of mobilization plans to deploy to the Russian frontier. And the planners say it's too late. The only option is to go through with our current deployment in the Balkans or to send everyone back to the stations, to the bases, and then start a new deployment. And von Hotzendorf believed it would be too embarrassing for all the soldiers who'd just been waved off from their stations, railway stations, to be sent back <laughs> and to have hmm. to get off again. So what he does, logically, is he deploys the majority of the army to the Balkans and then deploys them to Galicia on the kind of modern-day southern Poland, northern border with Ukraine, which is an a thousand kilometer diversion. The uh, end product of this is the fact that um, the Austrians facing the Russians, the Austro-Hungarians find themselves outnumbered, badly deployed, late. And even then, von Hotzendorf's solution, despite outnumbered um, heavily to the Russians, is to launch an offensive at the end of August 1914 against the Russians. So what happens when um, Hotzendorf launches his uh, first offensive of, of the war? It, it, it really has to be seen to be believed. He <laughs> orders all the cavalry in the Austro-Hungarian army to go on a reconnaissance mission 100 kilometers into Russian territory. Genius. What? Yeah. Um, now, they don't actually get anywhere near that far because the Russian army's in the way. And they've just been issued with new saddles that are designed to make the soldiers sit more upright posture-wise. Oh, boy. But it transpires the saddles actually rub the skin off the horses' backs. Wow. So by the what? third week of August, half of the army's horses are out of action. Um, so they launch a huge offensive, and uh, they suffer 100,000 killed, 220,000 wounded, and 100,000 taken prisoner. That is a third of the Austro-Hungarian army is lost by the 11th of September, 1914. What? So right from the outset, they are pretty much getting their asses kicked. Um, that is, you know, a sign of things to come. <laughs> but um, Well, maybe not, actually, because... Uh, the only army incapable of kicking the Austro-Hungarian's <laughs> asses is Italy. Um, right, so I suppose we should talk about the focus of this episode, which is the Isonzo Front. The stalemate, yes. The stalemate of the Isonzo, the main sort of fighting on the Italian front is along the Isonzo River, which runs from the Adriatic Sea through sort of sl the border of Slovenia up to Austria with uh, Italy mm -hmm. um, to the to the west of it. So Italy decides to, in, you know, 
in May 1915, they take advantage of the war. Presumably, they're aware of how you know how yeah. crap they know Austria Hungary is suing. Because of course, the and... Austro Hungarians invaded Serbia as well and got repelled by the yeah. Serbians. So, so it seems like a good opportunity, doesn't it? The Italian government thinks, okay, the Austrians, uh, the Austro-Hungarian army is crap. Uh, Austria-Hungary is definitely going to collapse. Um, when Europe is carved up after this big war, we want to be at the big boys' table. We want to annex some land from Austria. And there's uh, quite a lot of land they want to annex from them. Um, Dalmatia, Trentino, South Tyrol. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, sort of culturally Italian, Italian-speaking places, yeah. uh, which Italy feels uh, is rightfully Italian. And in the eyes of many sort of right-wing Italian patriots, uh, you know, absorbing these uh, states into Italy will be the final step in Italian reunification. Now, not all Italians are quite that enthusiastic about it because uh, in the countryside, um, most Italians are of a sort of peasant class who can't uh, read or write and basically answer to, you know, to the church and the pope rather than the Italian government. What I didn't realise is that obviously Italy is a very young country at this time. Um, and like you say, it's quite underdeveloped by European standards. Mm. And the um, kind of there's this big idea that it, 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 we haven't, we've made Italy, but we haven't made Italians yet because yeah. the language of mo modern Italian, the language that we kind of know today, was basically the language of Florence. Yeah, we rib on the Austro-Hungarians having many different dialects. And while the Italian, Italians didn't have quite as many, there were still different uh, dialects within the Italian army, which proved to be, you know, a smaller really? problem. Um, but yeah, so most Italians don't really have much of a strong opinion on the war one way or another. It's really just sort of, you know, the politicians in Rome and the politically active, you know, nationalists and socialists that have a strong opinion over whether the war, uh, whether Italy should enter the war or not. But ultimately, they're the ones with power, and they, you know, they get their way. So uh, Italy, you know, does enter the war on the side of the Western Allies. Um, and it's, it's really bad news for Austria-Hungary, of course, because, you know, they're already fighting uh, a war with Russia, which is incredibly costly for them. Um, so now, be attacked uh, from the south by the Italians is really the last thing they needed. Um, the war with Russia is still their main uh, priority. Mm -hmm. So they don't uh, field as many troops um, to the uh, Italian front. Um, and Hartzendorf places General Borovic, a, um, a Croat officer, in charge of the Austro-Hungarian forces um, along the Isonzo. Um, in June of uh, 1915, when the first battle of the Isonzo kicks off, uh, the Austrians have about 100,000 men and about 300 artillery pieces um, on, along the Isonzo front. And the Italians have double that. The Italians have 200,000 men and 700 artillery pieces. So the, Aust the Austrians are really outnumbered. And we, we should one. talk for a second here because the we go into this first battle on this front. There's two things that really come to my mind, which is the Austrians weren't prepared for this at all because, like we say, they're fighting a big two-front war already in the Balkans mm -hmm. and against the Russians. So... Um, I'm interested to know what troops they have to man this big frontier in the summer of 1915. Um, and secondly, the Isonso River, the valley, is where all this fighting is going to happen. And there is a reason why, despite the fact there is, seems to be there's 12 battles here, why there was only really, you know, more or less big battles here than anywhere else on the Austrian-Italian frontier. 
Um, so, so yeah, I believe to kind of go back to that first point, the Austrians or the Austro-Hungarians had to do quite a lot of, um, well, they, they were basically, I believe, recruiting like shooting associations in order to get this front man. Uh, so, yeah, if, if this is the uh, stand should say. Um, so, uh, in Austria, there were these like sort of old um, riflemen's guilds, like shooting fraternities called the St- uh, Standschützer, um, who were just basically, uh, they were like hobbyists, really. It was, um, it wasn't a official sort of military um, organization. And they had this sort of, you know, half-hearted um, pledge that if Austria were attacked, they would uh, hold up arms to defend it. And I don't think many of its members really expected to be, you know, called up on that. Yeah. But in World War One, already by mid-1915, the situation for Austria-Hungary is so desperate that these militias, who would be, in most cases, the last line of defense, are called up to actually fight on the Italian front. So they actually mobilize these uh, troops, who are basically made up of anybody exempt from military conscription. So, uh, and that's a pretty, you know, niche a group of individuals because Austro-Hungarian description is very wide. Uh, it's a very wide net. Uh, well, I've read that already by 1915 they'd raised the service age up to 50. Yeah. So these these shooting associations that are mobilised are going to be people who are 50 plus. Yeah, basically, um, people. Uh, the the Austro-Hungarian, you know army were taking people from you know i think like 18 to 34 and anybody above anybody from 34 to 55 would be you know placed in the reserves and anybody who didn't fit into that i suppose uh would have made up uh the sandwich so people with potentially you know health risks or people in their 60s 70s (laughs) This... Or, or people under the age of, you know, eight, like children, could be called up to 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 fight for these. And there is actually some photos of um, some members of the Standschützer on the Italian front during the war, and some of them do look incredibly young. Um, so they send uh, some of them out as some of the first troops to man the defenses on the Italian front, and. Of course, because they're not really a proper organ of the Austro-Hungarian armies, they're not equipped no. uh, adequately. They don't get winter clothing. They don't get, you know, it's, you know, I mean, it's just sort of alpine uh, terrain. It's incredibly yeah, that, cold. Hmm. Uh, very the mountainous. To it's the a terrain. nightmare. Um, which which is is a big factor why this is going to be a big stalemate this front isn't it the terrain yeah. because we're along um, the eastern Alps and the western Dolomites um, apparently the, you know we're looking at altitudes between nine hundred meters and three thousand meters um, mm. and I think as far as I understand it a lot of the front wasn't really a front in the sense it was sheer mountains or cliffs. So there was actually a limited number of, you know, slightly more passable valleys and mountain passes mm. and things like this where you actually had fighting. Um, and that's why you end up having 12 battles of the Isonza, as far as I understand it. Cadorna sees this valley, this river valley that you've described, which is still pretty mountainous, as being the only real passable terrain to launch major military operations. Of course, a byproduct of these conditions is that when the winter ro- rolls around, you know, every year, it mm-hmm. makes it just puts the fighting on complete hold because once it starts snowing heavily in this sort of terrain in the sort of alpine high altitudes, you, I mean, it's just not possible to maintain um, an offensive. Hmm. 
Um, and, you know, a lot of people, I mean, Cold is pretty much just as much a killer in this front as, you know, enemy once. Um, I heard that the winters in that whole period were some of the worst of the whole 20th century. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's really a shoddy front to be sent to. It's probably you know one of the worst in mm. terms of the conditions you're going to have to put up with. Uh, I mean, the mud and blood of the Western Front is bad enough, but the yeah, the conditions of I mean, they're still today finding uh, frozen bodies um, okay. in some of the mountains. So. Yeah, I heard that yeah. people, you know, sometimes you've got um, hundreds of soldiers killed at once in just avalanches. Yeah, we'll talk about that, yeah. Because um, in, I think, uh, 19, early 1917, uh, there's an avalanche which kills, you know, literally um, hundreds of Austrian troops in one fell swoop. Um so yeah, it's it is really probably the worst front to uh, end up on. I mean, the troops that got stationed there really drew the short straw. Um, right. So, yeah, so but... we've... <laughs> yeah, we've painted a bit of a picture here of two terrible armies, two terrible commanders. The Italians enter the war in May 1915. There's only one real section of the front where you can launch a major operation, or at least that's what Cadorna decides. Mm. So the Italians against very makeshift Austrian defences, as we've heard, um, launch an offensive in the Isonzo River Valley in June 1915, and I can only assume it's a huge breakthrough, right? No. (laughs) <laughs> it's a simple answer. Uh, the first battle with Isonzo begins on the 23rd of June, uh, 1915. And the Italians, as I mentioned, they mobilized 200,000 men and 700 artillery pieces, which is double that of the Austrians. So they outnumber them two to one. And granted, if you're launching an offensive, you do sort of need to outnumber uh, your enemy. This is a massive you know, advantage. And they don't capitalize on that at all it's basically it, it is like the uh typical early war battle yeah. um except by this point most of the armies of the war have already been through that in 1914 so in early 1915 so the italians are basically suffering the same mistakes that every other country like the french and uh, the germans suffered at the beginning of the war they're using you know old 19th century tactics they're you know they're they're walking troops into machine gun fire and artillery Uh, Cadorna really fails to appreciate you know the um the impact that these will have on mass infantry attacks um and how you know even if you you know send thousands of men if you throw thousands of men at you know an objective um, it just you know they will just be cut down and blown up, and you know Cadorna just just fails to realize this because presumably he's never actually seen a machine gun fired in you know in anger. Um, he uh, so there's there's quite a few objectives that the Italians try and take in this battle, and they're mostly sort of it's it's like mountains and mountain ridges. Um, that are strategic importance because it's uh that's really you know going to be the main brunt of the fighting on this front is going to be uh you know trying to take hills and and mountains rather than you know towns um it's it's a pretty sparsely populated area uh and basically i mean the short version is that they attack about four main you know points of interest and they suffer 13,000 casualties um, in the offensive so uh, if I yeah if I just bring up the casualty figures here uh, for the first battle of the ice on so it's uh, 13,000 uh, Italian casualties 10,000 Austrian casualties the Austrian casualties may be accurate 
But the Italian casualties are almost certainly played down um, because it would look very bad on the Italians um, if they had lost, you know, uh, more than like 20,000 men in the first battle alone. Mm. And this leads pretty much straight into the second battle of Isonzo, which basically is launched uh, only a few weeks after the first. So the second battle... Um, is basically a repeat of the first. It's um, same objectives, um, same tactics. Cadorna basically just thinks, you know, we got unlucky the first time. If we just <laughs> throw more men at it, it'll, you know, the the Austrians will. He th- he still thinks um, that, you know, as we're saying about um, sort of infantry doctrine. He really does believe that if you throw enough men at something, eventually it will fall. And he thinks that after the first battle, because the Italians have taken so many casualties, because his men have taken so many casualties, he thinks, well, we must have inflicted a hell of a lot on the Austrians then. You know, they must be at their breaking point. Mm. If we just commit more troops, then we'll probably find, you know, a skeleton crew defending these positions. Um, they do make some progress, actually, the Italians. They, they capture one mountain, say, uh, Mountain San Michel, um, but they're repelled almost instantaneously after they take it. Um, and uh, they lose um, 40,000 men, um, same, about the same as the Austrians. It's, it's a really costly battle for both sides. So... Again, no real progress. There are some sort of minor territorial gains, but nothing of any substance. So, so effectively, the war is declared in the summer 915. Cadorna launches a big offensive to try and capture the key mountains of this valley. He fails. Yeah. A few weeks later, he tries again and fails again. Yeah. And, so... and I should say that... Um, they're really not capitalizing on the power of artillery because the Italians have more guns than the Austrians um, and they are using them to pretty good effect. They're hitting their targets. They're, you know, destroying um, the Italian defenses. They are, you know, causing thousands of casualties for the Austrians. Uh, sorry, I meant the Austrian defense. They're causing thousands of uh, casualties for the Austrians. Most of the, you know, Austrian casualties in these battles will be from artillery barrages mm. uh but they always you know almost ubiquitously the italians delay after these barrages. cadorna doesn't commit the troops immediately uh, he doesn't recognize that you know the troops have to roll in as soon as the um you know the artillery finishes mm-hmm. um and as a consequence by waiting you know like an hour or two hours to attack giving the Austrians a chance to recuperate. And what the Italians find is they, you know, march up these mountains after, you know, they've been hit heavily. With it. They're expecting to find a bunch of dazed uh, Austro-Hungarian <laughs> troops, you know, who are just ready to surrender. What they're finding is the survivors have all, you know, regrouped, and they're manning their machine guns again, and they're just cutting them down. If you've got a two-hour gap between the barrage and the assault, I mean, you're basically... The, the barrage is more of an early warning system than anything else. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So Cadorna is not uh, adapting to um, sort of modern tactics at all. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what he of... thinks artillery's job is. I, I think he just <laughs> thinks it's like just to scare them and just beat them into submission. Uh, um, yeah, he's basically... Kind of expecting he's... it to clear the way and then the infantry will just capture the ground. Yeah, basically. Um, and it doesn't work. And then the third battle of the Isanza, they leave it a bit this time because the second battle ends on the 3rd of August and they leave it till the 18th uh, for the third battle. But the objectives are basically the same as the last time because they didn't really capture any major objectives last time. Uh, they, uh, the Italian bombardment takes out about 5,000 uh, Austro-Hungarian troops on the first day. So again, very successful initial bombardment. But again, they give them time to recuperate. Um, so the you know once the Italians attack again, it's the same story. Uh, they get repelled, sixty-eight thousand casualties to forty-two thousand Austrians. Um, there's a pattern emerging here. 
yeah. that isn't going to go away anytime soon. And the third Battle of the Ice Anzo ends on uh, the 4th of November. Um, and it's only a few days later, on the 10th of November, that the fourth battle begins. It's basically just a continuation. There isn't, there isn't really... It's not really a third and fourth battle of the Ice Anzo. It's basically one battle with a pause, a short pause in between. Mm. Um, so the fourth battle of the Isonzo is just a continuation of the third, same objectives, uh, and again, they fail to take them, but not because this time of uh, the Austrian defenses. This time it's because the winter kicks in, and uh, the heavy snowfall begins, and the Italians just can't maintain an offensive under these conditions. So they call it a uh they call it a year really <laughs> um well, i was gonna say it's probably um i'm not sure if cordona would have done but it's really a point at the end of 1915 to take stock because i believe the italian army was in a really poor way by the end of 1915 yeah and they have faced up to modern warfare and really found how tough it is i think mm. The casualty Chicken. figure is somewhere around 400,000 by the end yeah, of the Yeah, they've a hell of a lot of casualties. Um, and they have only made very slight territorial gains of no particular importance. I mean, when we're talking about the sort of like, you know, uh, territory gained in the battles of the Isonzo, it's, you know, it's like four miles. Yeah. You know, it's it's really small compared to other fronts. It's like that uh, bit in Blackadder where, uh, you know, the sort of uh, gags about, you know, when General Melchett has a, um, <laughs> a uh, you know, a small kind of section of grass on the, on a table. It says, this is how much, you know, this is how much ground we've gained <laughs> in the last offensive. It's, it's like that. It really is. Um, they're making no significant gains here and they're taking massive casualties. But the tactics never change. I was going to say the interesting thing is that this it seems to be a bit of a sliding doors moment at the end of 1915. They've launched four big offensives. They've suffered massive losses. The tactics haven't changed. The objectives haven't changed. They've tried the same thing near enough five times repeatedly, um, which, you know, there's the famous thing about definition of madness. Um, but unsurprisingly, morale's really at lock bottom. Um, yeah. The soldiers... Obviously, it's pretty grim winter conditions up in the mountains of the Alps and Dolomites. You, I, I was reading that Cadorna didn't believe in recreation for the soldiers. So in the times the units no. were out of the front, they were just in labor battalions building. That I mean, you oh, need a huge geez. amount well, of actually, infrastructure this, to build. Though this is bad for morale, this is actually Cadorna's greatest strength is because he is so obsessed with logistics. Uh by sort of essentially forcing the troops to, you know, take time out, you know, cutting time out of their, you know, leisure time and forcing them to work on vast sort of uh, bridges and roads along this, you know, mountainous terrain. He actually makes the Italian sort of lines of logistic um, much more efficient than the Austro-Hungarians. So they're moving, you know, artillery and uh, munitions really quickly compared to the Austro-Hungarians. Um, so although it, you know, uh, negatively in fact impacts the uh -huh. um, morale of the troops, it is um, is beneficial to the Italian war effort on the whole. What, what um, seems confusing to me is the fact that Cadorna's pre-war ethos is centered on morale. The army with the best morale yeah. will overcome. And yet he seems to demand just callousness and cruelty you know, he leads from example. Yeah. There's well, a couple of incidences. I'm sure there's more than two incidents, but in this winter of 1915, you get, um, you know, units mutinying when others get um, given leave and you get soldiers mm -hmm. executed. There's an example of um, a shot being fired at an officer's mess. And um, as a result, the eight men were... Um, executed in front of the whole regiment all everyone else had to watch as eight members of their of their unit are executed for this shot being fired at an officer's mess they didn't kill anyone didn't hurt anyone but um you know it just seems for a man focused on morale 
to not be able to identify that this could have a negative impact on morale? Well, for Cadorna, morale stemmed not out of, you know, uh, keeping the soldiers' spirits high, but just he just expected them to, you know, their duty. What's um, interesting is that there was an attempt to sack him in January of 1916. Clearly, you know, yeah, the government was enemies. very unhappy about the fact they'd launched four big offensives on the same place and not broken through or achieved anything and lost huge amounts. And yet, the man who tried to remove him, the Minister of War, Vittorio uh, Zuppelli, is the one who ends up getting sacked for trying to remove him. Yeah, yeah, yeah that is true. Yeah, uh, he was very spiteful um, and a very bitter man, uh, and he would not tolerate any sort of question of his leadership whatsoever. Um, in fact, it was actually only forces outside of Italy that would eventually bring his downfall. Um, anyway. What's interesting is that actually 1915 had gone quite well for the Austro-Hungarians. Um, Serbia had been defeated with German help. The Russians mm. had been driven back with German help. And um, in Italy, you know, as we heard, they were really up against it, but they'd managed to seemingly yeah. absorb all the best that the Italians had to throw at them. Mm. So 1916 was a year where the um, he wanted to go, von Hutzendorf wanted to go on the offensive in Italy. Um, he labelled it the punishment expedition. Um, he basically hoped to punish the Italians for their insolence and betraying the Austrians. And he, I think he genuinely believed that he was going to win the war on the Italian front, where, you know, where have the lessons of the last two years come gone? But what what's kind of criminal in a way is the kind of strategic thinking here, which is really what undoes um, the planned Trentino offensive, is that uh, the German commander, uh, chief of staff, um, von Falkenhayn, is focused on Verdun. Um, from February 1916, he launches a major offensive in the West. He draws... Um, eight German divisions away from the Eastern Front to fight at Verdun. Mm. He says to Conrad von Hotzendorf not to launch an offensive in Italy, um, but in what Alexander Watson terms a self-indulgent offensive. Um, that's exactly what Hotzendorf does. Um, he pulls a further four Austro-Hungarian divisions and pretty much all of the Austro-Hungarians' heavy artillery away from the Eastern Front leaving the Eastern Front week. <laughs> they were gonna, we're putting a bomb under the table there that's going to go off shortly. Um, and he plans from the Austrian Supreme Headquarters, which is, by the way, 1,200 kilometres away from the Italian Front, and he never visits the Italian Front at this, at this stage, at least. Mm. He plans a major offensive that is going to win the war, um, known as the Trentino Offensive or the Battle of... Asiago. So, they plan this big operation, Trentino Offensive. How does it go? Right. Well, initially, uh, very successfully, um, the Austro-Hungarians launched this uh, big counter-offensive, the Trentino Offensive, on the 15th of May. Um, and they catch Cadorna completely off guard. Uh, he doesn't see it coming. You know, everyone was expecting this but him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Basically, Italian intelligence uh, had already kind of intercepted this, and they'd warned him about it, and they said it was going to happen, but he didn't believe anybody. Um, and uh, as a consequence, when it did happen, he was caught completely off guard, um, and he hadn't prepared for it at all. Um, and the Austrians initially uh, managed to push the Italians back five miles, which is like, you know, wow on this front yeah um, in any other front yeah that wouldn't be that impressive um and uh it, for a moment it looks so bad that the italian government resigns oh. um because they think we're gonna lose um but Dorna does actually manage to adapt pretty quickly uh and you know regroup his uh, remaining, you know, troops, and um, he basically re redirects troops from, you know, other areas um, over to uh, Asiago to 
uh, slow down the Austrian attack, which is already kind of losing momentum. Um, and it's really hindered, really, you know, going in Cadorna's favor is the fact that the Russians um, around the same time launched the Bruslov offensive. Exactly. Mm. is devastating to the Austro-Hungarians yeah. in the because... uh, Eastern Front. As we're kind of saying, both the Germans with Verdun and the Austro-Hungarians with this Turin, uh, Trentino offensive really strip the Eastern Front of troops, um, leaving it exposed for a major offensive in Galicia by the Russians, the Brusilov offensive, which causes a, a total collapse hmm. in the in the Austro-Hungarian lines on that on the Eastern Front. So, uh, yeah, um, basically, has to. He's told by Berlin, "You've got to call off your Italian yeah. operations and move troops." So, uh, Hartzendorf had intended for this to be, you know, the big push to knock Italy out of the war, and what he found, really, in practice, was that halfway through, he needs to redirect thousands to the Eastern Front urgently. Um, so the Trentino offensive fizzles out uh, prematurely. It still manages to inflict 15,000 Italian casualties compared to 10,000 Austro-Hungarians. Um, but that's really uh, Hudson Dolph's, you know, main opportunity to uh, knock Italy out of the war in 1916. And for reasons, you know, not entirely within his control, um, it doesn't go as he had hoped. Mm. Um, so the Austrians, uh, you know, revert back to the defensive as they were before, and they have less manpower now in the uh, in the Isonzo. And and then Cadorna decides to kind of take advantage of this situation um, of the Austrians being distracted, and he actually kind of shows a little bit of learning for the next battle of the Isonzo, the sixth one. In the sense that um, he obviously knew the Austro-Hungarians would be weakened, he knew they also that they he had a bit of an element of surprise because they weren't expecting an offensive so quickly from the Italians. This was launched in August of mm. 1916, um, and he also deploys his uh, offensive, his troops on a much small, smaller frontage with a much more limited objective. Yeah, so this is the sixth battle of the Isonzo on the 4th of August. Um, for the first time, Cadorna focuses on a singular objective. It's the town of Gorizia. Um, so he consolidates you know, most of his troops to taking this town. And uh, it actually goes really well for the Italians when they actually you know, focus their efforts. Um, so, uh, the Italian, uh, artillery barrage, as always, is, you know, devastating to the Austrian defenses. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Borovic is really short on manpower. Um, and this, you know, artillery barrage has, you know, uh, taken out a large portion of the frontline Austrian defenses. So the Italians managed to take two sort of minor objectives uh, that were, you know, causing them issues in 1915. They finally managed to take them on the way to Gorizia. And the Italian offensive combined with the very, you know, effective artillery barrage completely wipes out the Austrian defense at Gorizia. Uh, the Austrians basically in full retreat. Um, and the Italians basically walk into the town um, unopposed. Uh, but there's a catch. As now, there always is. <laughs> the, the Austrians are, you know, they're, they're on the run, and a good general would have his, uh, you know, his troops face after them. And Cadorna has this opportunity to just, you know, roll right over them if he just keeps up the momentum of the offensive. Um, but uh, the officer in charge of taking Gorizia, uh, the Duke of Iosta, um, deliberately impedes this. Um, he delays the uh, Italians from pursuing the uh, Austrians because he wants to personally ride into Gorizia on his favorite white horse. So it takes about three days for him to arrive. 
Um, by which time the Austrians have retreated and successfully regrouped at a secondary uh, line of defense. So they do take Gorizia. They don't fully capitalize on their, uh, you know, their victory. Uh, they, they again, they hesitate because you know, a stupid officer wanted uh, a <laughs> moment of glory, basically. Uh, so that's about fifty thousand Italian casualties to forty thousand Austrians, which is pretty evenly matched, considering that most of the uh, battles up until now have been, you know, drastically more Italian casualties than Austrians. So that's this is really a, a big victory for the Italians, um, but they don't follow up on it, of mm. course. So we. <laughs> We kind of had two breakthroughs, if you like, in the summer of 1916 mm-hmm. on this stalemated front, but both of them, for different reasons, fizzle out and don't turn into major victories, end up being pretty limited gains in both respects. And then there's a series of three more Aysan So battles, of course, um, in the autumn of, of 1916. Yeah. Um, is there anything different or interesting um, about these, or is it just no? More... It's yeah. it's really it's okay. It's it's more of the same. Well, actually, there are some interesting points. So on the seventh battle of Isonzo, which takes place on the fourteenth to the eighteenth of September, it's only a four day affair. Um, the Italians uh, decide to pursue the Austrians into the Julian Alps. Terrain is even worse in this area. Um, it's even, you know, the the conditions are in hard. It's like, you know, uh, very cold. Uh, it's very wet because the uh, it's, it's just raining constantly uh, during this attack. Their main objective is Caso, which they are repelled um, at. And uh, on the 9th of October, they launched the 8th battle to kind of follow up on that. Um, where they again uh, attack Caso, but they realize they can't do it from just sort of frontal uh, assault, they've let the Austrians dig in too much. Cadorna uh, launches a sort of two-pronged pincer attack on, on the sort of north and south sides of Carso. Um And it's really incredibly effective. Um, even though Italian morale at this point is, is really dwindling because of how, you know... Uh, a little progress ultimately has been made in the war as a, as a whole. The offensive here almost knocks the Austro, uh, Austro-Hungarians out of the Isonzo front. So, as we you know mentioned before, uh, Borovic is really running short on manpower, and he's not being relieved by Hartzendorf because of the Eastern Front. Um, so, when the Italians attack uh, Caso, it pretty much causes the Austrian line of defense to completely collapse. There's most of the uh, companies left fighting at um, Caso are incredibly short in manpower. They're, you know, like a, a shell of their former selves. And it does look like the Italians have it in the bag. However, when they reach uh, Caso, they're met with incredibly stiff resistance, inexplicably, from a comparatively small force. Uh, because what's happened is um, the officer in charge of um, one of the surviving companies at Caso, he's a uh, Austrian officer called Lieutenant uh, Theodor Vanka. Um, he actually, uh, the Austrian, most of the most of the Austrian troops um, want to retreat, but he forces them at gunpoint to stand their ground and fight. It works. Uh, they dig in uh, after taking, you know, a heavy hit from uh, the t- Italian artillery um, and under the threat of execution uh, they fight back and they defend Caso against the Italians and they successfully repel them. I think I think the Italians sort of get cold feet and think that there's more Austrian troops survive the barrage than there actually is hmm. and they fall back. There's a final battle in the in the autumn in late October and early November um, of 1916. It must be said the winter of 1617 was possibly the worst one of the war. 
I was gonna, it was kind of we're looking at minus 30 degrees but they do have one more go and in a way you can see that Cadorna he he tries exactly the same plan again <laughs> the same yeah. objectives all about Carso <laughs> again same plan do it again it worked this time in a way you can kind of see why because the Austro-Hungarians really are in a state of collapse now yeah um, so this is basically what Cadorna thought would happen you know, in the uh, uh, by about the second or third Isanzo, you know, in offensive, yeah. like in 1915, he thought by like the second or third battle they'd be at the stage that they're actually at now. Um, so it's he has reached the point he wanted to be at, but it's taken him over a year, and um, hundreds of thousands of cash. and hundreds yeah. of thousands of men. So it's a very slow progress, but essentially he thinks he's at the cusp of victory. His Obviously, his uh, allies in the West, Britain, France, you know, are growing increasingly impatient. And there's real pressure on him and from the Italian government to defeat Austria-Hungary by the end of the year. It's the 31st of October by the 9th Battle of the Isonzo. Um, so, you know, it's really drawing, uh, to, 1916 is drawing to a close. And Cadorna really needs to give the Austrians the boot. Um, and initially in northern Carso, he's uh, he's successful. Um, and again, the Austro-Hungarians, uh, you know, uh, they they look like they're going to collapse. There's very thin on manpower. Um, morale on the Austro-Hungarian side is low. Uh, but the Italians simply, you know, lose momentum. Um, and again, very small. Uh, Austrian reserves managed to, you know, repel the demoralized sort of. I mean, both sides at this point are not in very good fighting condition. Uh, they're, you know, pretty stretched for manpower, and the morale at this point, it's it's for both sides, is at an all time low. So, uh, the Austrians really, even though they're numerically inferior to the attacking Italians, they have the advantage of being defense you know um and they managed to you know time and time again repulse the italians um again big casualties thirty thousand. um so yeah that's the ninth battle it lasts from the 31st of october to the 4th of november it's really just yeah it's like a repeat of um of last time they, they still haven't properly you know the Italians haven't secured Carso but um so yeah I mean after the ninth battle the winter begins to set in and of course you know it's fighting conditions uh, uh deteriorate so they, neither side is any any and another position kind of fight. miserable time after two years of really attrition as we've seen yeah. warfare over the same ground huge so, casualty very limited progress a terribly cold winter, and I don't know how much we mentioned, but the, you know, really not great winter equipment either mm. in terms of clothing and things like that. Yeah, absolutely Often. not. Um, and yeah, so it's really the breaking point. I mean, um, patience for Cadorna's kind of tactics is wearing incredibly thin at this point. He's becoming increasingly unpopular, and he's only really defending his position as chief of staff by just firing anybody who criticizes him. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's a real problem here. So, and, and, you know, when 1917 rolls around, the Allies, the Western Allies, are really, you know, becoming critical of the Italian conduct of the war, and uh, they agree to step in and provide assistance, but they still want the Italians to be, you know, they don't want to be carrying the war for the Italians. Um, and they don't want to take, you know, manpower away from the Western Front. Britain uh, agrees to send some um, artillery pieces to uh, help um, the Italians. That's all they found, though. Um, and, uh, I, yeah, and as we mentioned before, the winter of... Um, 1916 and early 1917, uh, there's a series of avalanches that wipe out 
a huge amount of Austrian troops. Um, just to give an idea of how really miserable the conditions are in these areas. I mean, something like 2,000 men are lost um, to the uh, to the avalanches uh, during this time. So it's not good. For the, it doesn't and do yet, this for morale. No. Um, no. And yet we get two more ice on so offensives. Oh, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Uh, but in the meantime, before uh, that happens, it is probably worth pointing out that Emperor Franz Joseph I of Austria-Hungary dies in November 1916 mm -hmm. and is replaced by Karl I, who... The... He sacks Hartzendorf, doesn't he, as chief of staff? Yes, he does. He does. Him and Hartzendorf uh, don't get on. And in uh, 1917, uh, Karl I will... Uh, fire Hansendorf. Um, Although interestingly, he, that... instead of being kind of booted out, he's he's put in charge of an army on the Italian front. He is he is allowed um, a small degree of power. Yes, he is given uh, control of a, a sort of reserve army on the Italian front. Um, but his sort of you know his his role as chief of staff is over, mm -hmm. and his influence in you know Austro-Hungarian politics is over, really. Um, Cadorna manages to get a couple more rolls of the dice. Yes, Cadorna isn't going anywhere yet. Uh, he's still, you know, he's still in complete control of the Italian army, and nobody can oust him. And the Italian government is not really uh, in touch with the consequences of appointing him. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the first uh, Battle of the Ice Anso in 1917 is the Tenth Battle of the Ice Lines. So we're into the we're into double figures, into double digits. Um, and uh, that begins on the twelfth of May. Again, they have to wait a long time for the conditions to uh, sort of brighten up. Uh, the Austrians, by this point, because of the delay uh, through the winter, they've really regained quite a lot of their strength. Um, they're not really a breaking point on the Italian front anymore. Um, They've had some troops relieved from the uh, Eastern Front and moved to the uh, yeah, so-and-so front. Uh, the Italians, you know, once again, launch an offensive. Uh, their artillery barrage, as always, inflicts heavy casualties, but uh, they lose a lot of men um, in their attacks on two objectives, um, Mount 383 and Mount uh, Santo. These have been kind of problem spots from the beginning of the Italian offensive. Um, Mount 383 in particular has, uh, you know, cost um, thousands of, of lives. But finally, the 10th Battle of the Isonzo, the Italians have managed to take it. Mount Santo, they only hold for a, a few days, and that is retaken by the Hungarians almost immediately. Um, the uh, Second phase of the attack is aimed at Carso, and the Italians fire a million artillery shells at uh, Carso and still come up short. Um, I mean, it's the same story. I don't really know what I can kind of add, but uh, yeah, it's it's they you know they they're just not kind of capitalizing on these periods these these windows where the Austrian defences are in complete disarray, they always leave it too late. The the infantry never moves in fast enough. Um, and it's I think it's the costliest battle uh, to date uh, on this front because 150,000 Italians are lost, 80,000 Austrians. So although <laughs> both armies through the winter had just you know recuperated their strength back, to being exhausted in 1917, they immediately both take a hammering. And morale uh, was bad enough in 1916, and now it's really bad. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, Italians are defecting and deserting. Um, there's anti-war demonstrations at home. Uh, and this is something. Um, in August, uh, I think, uh, the Pope um, calls for an end to the war which is devastating for the morale of both sides yeah because obviously they're you know majority roman catholics yeah 
and as you know, I mentioned the majority of um, Italians at the time weren't really loyal to the Italian state as they were to the Vatican. Mm. Um, so it's yeah, uh, this is probably the lowest point morale in the entire war. It's um, for for the both the Austro-Hungarians and the Italians. Well, uh, there's we... really no desire to keep it going for for the average infantryman. Um, so, what's his solution then? Surely, not launching another offensive on the <laughs> Isonzo River. Well, um, yeah. uh, the eleventh battle, the Isonzo is launched on the eighteenth of August. So, what Cadorna actually tries doing this time? Um, I mean, he's experimented with this before, but he kind of ups it. Um, this time is diversionary assaults. So kind of false flag attacks on a different sort of minor Austrian fence points mm. to try and draw Bar- Barovich's troops over to those lightly defended areas and move troops away from the key objectives. Uh, it's really in kind of two phases. There's a, there's like a small assaults on Mount Santo, Mount Saint. San Gabriel and Tomlin Bridgehead, um, and the uh, Sisa Pato, um along the kind of Isonzo, um, the kind of banks of the Isonzo, and uh, most of these attacks are just sort of repelled pretty easily by the uh, Austrians. Uh, but um, there is a gap opened in the Austrian flank, um, which really really critical mm. um to the austrian defenses uh but cadorna just fails to realize this um he 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 i i he does recognize that there is a weakness in their defenses that he could exploit but he deliberately doesn't why because i um um because i i think he believes it's it's a it's like a trap um i don't think he even has confidence in himself at this point <laughs> Um, it's really it's it's quite inexplicable. It's quite inexplicable. He you know he has this opportunity and he doesn't take it. Um, and of course you know too late the Austrians managed to reinforce it. Um, Carso again they try and take Carso, and again it's left open by a you know devastating Italian artillery barrage, but they hesitate and um, amazingly. Uh, uh, on the assault on Carso, um, the Italians managed to take six thousand. They managed to lose six thousand um, troops, uh, not through kind of uh, casualties, but through surrenders. So this is really exemplifying the uh, weakness of the Italian morale at this point. They're not even turning back and running; mm. they're surrendering to the Austrian lines rather than go back um, to their lines to, to fight again. They're sick of it. Yeah. They know that if they, you know, retreat, Cadorn is just going to send them back, you know, like a few weeks later. Um, and the Italians lose 150,000 men compared to 100,000 of the Austrians. As you'll see, you know, the casualty figures are getting higher and higher. And we've been stuck at Carso for about, you know, Four battles, yeah, um, Indeed. or more. So it's you know nothing is happening. Really, nothing is happening. And um, it takes, um, well, it takes a competent army to come in and um, really break this stalemate. Yeah. In October of nineteen seventeen, finally, something is going to happen. The something stalemate. major. Yeah. Word, it comes to an end, so, and it's the Germans who bring it to an end. It is really the Germans who bring it to an end, uh, but it's a great... This is the high point in probably the entire war for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, because despite everything, all their troubles, 1917, Russians are knocked out of the war by the revolution at home. Hmm. So that front is closed. The Austrians can now move thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of troops to reinforce the Italian front. 
not only that, but the um, Soviet government and the new, you know, uh, communist government in Russia agrees to release the Austro-Hungarian prisoners of war. Mm. Um, a small point about these is that um, although they, you know, uh, the Austro-Hungarians do receive, you know, thousands of POWs from the Eastern Front, um, not only are a lot of them sort of emaciated and sick, uh, but they're also uh, infected with what the Austrians, the Austro-Hungarian government considers a um, a sickness of the mind. Uh, oh boy, they have been infected with. Uh, <laughs> The disease of communism. <laughs> um, so they come back as sort of anti-war pacifists. Um, and uh, they're not really much good, but it doesn't matter because the, you know, the relief from the Eastern Front mm. uh, is big reinforcement to the Austro-Hungarian army at this point. The Austro-Hungarian army at this point also decide to uh, raise um, stormtrooper battalions, mm. sort of in, uh, aping the German practice. Uh, the Germans had kind of launched uh, assault battalions, Sturmtruppen, um, you know, a uh, few years earlier. And the Austrians uh, launch, you know, they raised their own uh, stormtrooper battalions um, who are basically going to take the lead in an upcoming offensive that um, the Austro-Hungarians have planned. And they haven't planned it alone because uh, the Austro-Hungarian government has asked uh, Germany for help. Mm. And the Germans, they've asked the Germans for help quite a few times, and the Germans have always refused on the basis that they can't work with people like Hartzendorf, who yeah. uh, want complete control of the army. They won't work with people like him. Um, but Karl uh, the first, uh, he fires Hartzendorf. He has enough of Hartzendorf. He right. fires him uh, and puts him in command of you know like a a smaller um, army on the uh, on the Italian front. And now that Hartzendorf's out of the picture, um, Karl goes to uh, Germany to ask for their help, and they accept under the condition that they be allowed to uh, you know, command in totality this upcoming offensive that the Austrians have planned. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, they're massively reinforced from troops from the East and from uh, six German divisions. And they, they launch a uh, huge offensive on the um, 24th of October, which completely uh, catches the Italians unaware. Um, there's a 2,000 gun barrage which uh, just completely shocks the Italian um, front line of defenses um, followed by immediately by um, shock troop assaults. Oh. Uh, these new stormtrooper battalions um, which are specially trained in, you know, trench raids. So unlike the Italians who have been <laughs> hitting the Austrians hard with artillery and then sort of dilly-dallying, not really consolidating on that, this is, you know, the this is a textbook assault. You've got this yeah. massive coordinated artillery barrage followed by mass waves of assault infantry who just completely overwhelm the surviving Italians. In fact, the Italians don't even fight back um, for the most part. They simply panic and surrender or just flee. Um, the uh, Germans and the Austrians push so hard that they gain 16 miles in the first day alone, which you consider that one of the most successful uh, Italian offensives so far gained about four miles of ground. 16 miles in one day is same for the Italian front. Yeah. Um it's the stalemate broken, isn't it? And they yeah. over the next few days they managed to push them well pretty much out of the Alps and Dolomites, don't they? They, they completely get... all pretty much all the Italian gains that have been made so far, which are tiny, but 
all the all that loss of life for those sort of minor objectives along the way is all lost. The Italians are in complete panic. The Italian second army just collapses. It just evaporates. Um, the, the Italians just abandon their posts, and um, the uh, it's just yeah, it's just complete chaos. Um, the Italians are pushed all the way back to the Paeve River. It's just you know outside of Venice, so it's it's on the Italians' doorstep now. The the, the mm. shoe is really on the other foot, uh, and you know the Italian war effort has just backfired completely. Now that their their you know their border is being threatened, uh, the Italians do manage to slow down the uh, offensive uh, slightly because um, obviously. Dorna had built this large network of uh, bridges and roads that were imperative to the, you know, Italian logistics. Um, and the Germans want to make use of these, take advantage of them to quickly pursue the Italians. And the Italians um, uh, decide to destroy them rather than letting the uh, Germans, you know, use them. So that does slow them down a bit. Um, but basically the outcome of this is, uh, probably the biggest mass surrender, I think, uh, of the war, uh, of, of like any one battle of the war. That's 250,000 Italian prisoners taken Jeez. by the Germans and the Austrians. Um, so like I say, the second Italian army basically just collapses entirely and uh just gives up uh, they lose 40,000 men through casualties um compared to 70,000 austro-german casualties um so the italian government again uh collapses um and finally luigi cadorna the writing is on the wall for him uh the allied you know high command um presses for his dismissal and the uh, Italian army, you know, has no choice. The government has no choice but to dismiss him. Um, so Cadorna's reign of terror is over, finally. And, and so too, I suppose, is the, the stalemate on yes. the narrow front. Um, yeah. Over 12 pounds. By no means, it's by no means an end to the conflict on the Italian front. Yeah. Mm. You get um, you get another stalemate in pretty much the lines that this battle finishes on on the Piave River for uh, almost yeah. a year. I should really talk about the sort of uh, consequence on morale now, since morale has been so bad on the uh, Italian front, especially in sort of 1917 and 1916. Um, you would think this would be it for the Italians. This would be breaking point, considering mm. how many of them surrendered. Uh, at Caporetto, and you know how the army is pretty much in complete disarray. Um, you'd think, well, anti-war sentiment in Italy must be at its peak. They must like desperately want to surrender. Mm. Um, the inverse, paradoxically, is true. This is the single biggest boost morale for the Italians since the war began yeah it's it, the war war fever just takes its hold on the entire country after caporetto the you know sort of dissidents who were anti-war in the beginning disappear and now all of italy pretty much is in favor of the war because it's in their minds it's proven what uh sort of propaganda that, that that was being fed from the beginning um about uh the you know sort of austrian austrians wanting to kind of break up italy by holding you know italian mm. territories and that sort of thing i mean really after Caporetto, it really does like like italy as a unified country is under threat and uh the you know the Austrians might invade, and nobody wants that. So I guess I'll just give a condensed version of uh, the end of the Italian front, since it's really not the main focus here. 
um, because the stalemate uh, has been brought to an end. Mm. There's a like like we said, there's a mini stalemate that happens from um, from this point, from the you know end of November 1917, in the space between then and um, the uh, 24th of October 1918. Uh, it's really just decline for the Austro-Hungarian Empire on the home front. It's more and more kind of uh, independence movements breaking out. Um, the uh, you know the 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 Habsburg Empire is really crumbling. Um, they don't really have an army anymore. Yeah, because they're so stretched for for men. And uh, at some point, the Hungarian government actually recalls the Hungarian army from the Italian front and says, "You can come home." Um, to which pretty much all Hungarians agree, is there's really no desire to keep fighting. I mean, from from the Austro-Hungarian perspective, they've been fighting the war for four years, and uh, they know they can't keep it up. And the prospect of actually defeating Italy at this point, despite the massive success of Caporetto, is incredibly unrealistic. And there's really no desire to invade Italy among the average. Austrian or Hungarian soldier, uh, you know the the Emperor Karl, you know, recognizes this, and he doesn't want to stay in the war. He wants to um, pull out of the war and consolidate his efforts to try to reunite the empire. Um, but the Germans, um, you know, demand that he take it out to the end. And on the anniversary of Caporetto, twenty fourth of October, nineteen eighteen. General Diaz launches um, a major Italian offensive with French, uh, American, and British um, support, uh, infantry, artillery, um, aerial, naval. Um, and they just uh, destroy what is left of um, the Austro-Hungarian army. Uh, and from that point, the sort of road to Vienna is completely left open. The Austro-Hungarian Empire has to surrender. They don't have a choice. Uh, the Austro-Hungarian government has collapsed entirely. And uh, it's it's curtains for them. It's kind of like a, almost an anticlimax, isn't it? After all See, that yeah, yeah, it really is. Over the... the... On the kind of borderlands in the Isonso Valley, and so many battles and offensives, and so many hundreds of thousands of lives lost, and so much misery and suffering, and it all kind of ends with a whimper, really, of just one side capitulating. Yeah, um, it, it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, sort of incredibly big anticlimax, really. Um, the first, you know, few years of the Italian front were completely unnecessary. Um, achieved nothing in the grand scheme of things. And that's um, what makes it, you know, history's <laughs> greatest stalemate. Or worst greatest stalemate. Yeah. Even if we had 12 major battles before Caporetto without any significant progress. So, um, yeah. yeah. It's pretty stalematey. I... I don't think that our listeners will ever be able to come up with something quite as bad as this. In terms of sheer manpower, uh, in terms of, you know, troops mobilized and, uh, you know, certainly in terms of casualties, I don't think that's a bigger stalemate in history. Yeah. Um, if you, if you compare, you know, uh, if you compare sort of a, a graph of, Casualties compared to ground gained. Yeah, this is this has got to be in the lead. I mean, probably. And I would nominate it probably as uh, one of the worst fronts to be sent in World War One, and that's saying something because there wasn't a, there wasn't many nice fronts to be sent to. Yeah. Well, thank you, Freddy, for joining us uh, and well. telling us this this story of of mediocrity um and incompetence because that is proper history's most stuff absolutely 
it's our speciality. And if somehow you can think of a more, uh, well, a worse stalemate than this, that by all means, please, we we absolutely love to hear it. And we'd also be slightly doubtful. But um, you can email us at uh, histories.most at gmail.com. Uh, and you can also follow us on Twitter at History's Most. So from us here at History's Most, uh, my name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and thank you for listening to History's Most. Mm-hmm.